Uh, this is uh, tonight is week two of an introduction to the Talmud designed for women, not because there's anything unique about the women's experience of Talmud study versus a man's, but as I mentioned last week, we're working under the assumption that part of your educational upbringing did not have an emphasis on Talmud. So we take nothing for granted as far as your knowledge base. If I do end up inadvertently taking something for granted, please just raise your hand and say, what did you mean by that? And I'll be happy to, uh, to clarify. Uh, last week, what we covered was defining the term Torah Shaba'al Peh, or the oral law or the oral transmission. We have a better understanding now of the role of Mishnah and Gemara, the two terms which form collectively what we call the Talmud. We explain the difference between Talmud Bavli and Talmud Yerushalmi, the Babylonian Talmud and the Palestinian or Jerusalem Talmud. We talked a little bit about the timeline. We explained what the project of Rabbi Yehuda Halevi was, not Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, sorry, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Sorry, wrong, wrong shear. Same classroom, wrong shear. We talked about what Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi's project was uh, in deciding to redact or to commit to a certain text, the Mishnah, um, even though this endeavor was actually forbidden up to his time. Something that originally had been forbidden, which was to commit an oral transmission into a text, is something that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi Rabbi Huda Hanasi, sorry, in the second century undertook because he felt eight la sot la shem heferu Torah techa. It was a time that even though sometimes it may appear that you are relaxing a certain regulation, a certain prohibition, but if it is for the greater good because the generations have been diminishing in their ability to retain the oral transmission in its oral form, you have no choice but to commit it to writing. And this was his project. One of the ingenious things that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi did in redacting the Mishnah is that he created a structure for the topics that are contained in all of the Torah. Um, and the first page of your handout tonight has a very lovely little chart of the six orders of the Mishnah. Um, that, that probably you're familiar with, that there are six orders to the Mishnah. From when, when would we all know that from? There you go. Shisha Sidre Mishnah. Right? So, that, so, so that's how we know that there are six orders to the Mishnah, because if there weren't six orders, if there were seven or five, then the song would be really messed up, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't have anything for six. So who knows six? It's the six orders of the Mishnah. And what that essentially means is that there are six uh, m- um, mega categories of information that are contained in the Torah. We'll go over these, these six categories. You may just want to fill in the translation for yourselves if the Hebrew was unfamiliar to you. Um, now, the, the six categories of information, zeraim is the first, which literally means seeds, but it deals with the agricultural laws that are contained in the Torah. And the reason why that comes first is because the Jewish people are first and foremost an agricultural society. You look through the entire Chumash and you discover that so much of our life cycle is based on agriculture, is based on farming. Uh, the, the Shalosh Regalim, the three festivals, are based on the, the, the life patterns of farming, the times of harvest, the times of the first fruits, the time of the reaping, the first reaping. So all of these things are, are connected. Now, the second category is Moed, which literally means either festival or a time of meeting, a time or place of meeting. The word Ohel Moed 
is the tent of meeting. That's the, the, the Beit HaMikdash, or the Mishkan. It's called the tent of meeting, because the word Mo'ed just means either place or time of meeting. In this context, it means a time of meeting, which means a reference to all of the holy days of observance and all of the laws related to those holy days. Um, before I go any further, maybe we should look at the subcategories, which are known as tractates or mesechtot in Hebrew. Um, the tractates are the subcategories of those mega categories. If we look at zra'im, here are the subcategories, the, the masechtot. Brachot is the first. And even though brachot does not relate directly to agriculture, because it deals with the laws of making blessings and prayer, but it certainly is related to agriculture in the sense that so much of the prayers that we say do relate to our agricultural and food needs. So therefore, much of Masechet Brachot deals with the blessings that we make before and after we eat. So that's one of the reasons why it is in, Mas in the order of Zeraim. As you'll note, some of these Masechtot, of these tractates, that are placed in the, one of these six cat mega categories, sometimes some of them fit better than others. Brachot is not the best fitting for Zeraim, but it needed to be, Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi felt that it needed to be placed first because of its prominence in everyday living of prayer and blessings. Pe'a is the name of a tractate that deals with the mitzvah of leaving a corner, that's what the word pe'a means, the corner of your field unharvested for the poor. Demai refers to the status of produce when it is unclear that it, whether it has been tithed or not. Kilayim refers to a biblical prohibition of mixing wheat and grape seeds in the same field together. Kilayim, mixing. Shavi'it refers to the laws of the sabbatical year, what we call Shemitah. Trumot deals with the tithe that is given to the Kohen. Ma'asrot deals with the tithe that is given to the Levite. Ma'aser Sheni deals with the tithe, our agricultural tithe, that, we, that you're supposed to take up to Jerusalem and eat yourself. Chala deals with the dough tithe, which is when you bake bread, before you bake it, you have to take a tithe from the dough and present that to the Kohen. Orla refers to the law that for the first three years of a tree's growth, its produce is forbidden. And finally, Bikurim refers to the mitzvah of first fruits that have to be brought to the temple, meaning that if I have an orchard and I'm growing pomegranates, let's say, the very first pomegranates that grow are placed in a basket brought up to Jerusalem sometime between Shavuot and Sukkot over the summer, and I present it to the Kohen. Okay? So those are, uh, those are the, the tractates within, tracta within Seder Zeraim. Seder Mo'ed, as I mentioned, deals with the holy times. So Shabbat, of course, self-explanatory, an entire tra very long tractate, by the way, about all of the laws of Shabbat. Eruvin deals with the laws of creating enclosed areas that allow a person to carry on Shabbat, but also deal with the laws of Eruvei Tchumin, which allow a person to travel beyond the borders of his city on Shabbat. Even without carrying, that's forbidden without making a special type of Eruv. Pesachim deals with the Paschal sacrifice and deals with the celebration of Passover in general. Shekalim deals with the Machatzit HaShekel, which has to be brought to Jerusalem um, in order to purchase the sacrifices. Every Jew, the communal sacrifices, every Jew has to bring the Machatzit HaShekel, the half shekel because it's brought at specific times in the year. That's why it's in this particular order. Yoma deals with Yom Kippur. Sukkah deals with what holiday? You guessed it, Sukkot. Beitzah 
deals with the laws of Yom Tov, and, part, and in particular has a focus on the laws of Muktze. And the reason it's called Beitza is because a freshly laid egg, that is, when the chicken lays an egg, on Yom Tov, that egg is Muktze. Muktze means what? It is precluded. It's a rabbinical law that anything that was not prepared from the day before Yom Tov is not permitted on Yom Tov. So that's a special form of Muktze called Nolad, but it's all under the category of Muktze. Rosh Hashanah deals with the holiday of, you guessed it, Rosh Hashanah. Ta'anit deals with the laws of the fast days, both the fast days that you and I have on our calendar, such as Tisha B'Av, Shiva Asar um, and also dealing with fast days that can be instituted by the Sanhedrin in times of drought or famine, God forbid. Does not deal with the fast of Yom Kippur because Yom Kippur has its own tractate. What is that called? Yoma. Good. Megillah deals with what holiday? Purim. Good. Moed Katan deals with the laws of Chol HaMoed the intermediate days of the festival, and also deals with some of the laws of mourning, of Avelut, are contained in Moed Katan. And Masechet Chagiga, finally, deals with the sacrificial laws of the festival sacrifice, the Korban Chagiga, which is brought every Yom Tov that a person makes a pilgrimage, in addition to the special Korbanot that are brought on that festival, Every individual brings a Korban Chagiga. Okay, the third order of Mishnah is called Nashim. See, you thought that women didn't have a role in the Talmud, right? But there's a whole one-sixth of, of Shas, of Shisha Sidre Mishnah, is devoted, to, is devoted to laws that are pertinent specifically to the male and female relationship. Yevamot is the first that deals with the law of leveret marriage, or what we call yibum in the Torah. It's a biblical law that if a man dies without children and he leaves over a widow, then there is a mitzvah for leveret marriage, uh, for the decedent's brother to marry the widow and to build a family sort of in memory of his deceased brother. The alternative to yibum is chalitza, which is what is done largely today. Kitubot is a tractate about the ksuva, that a man, this is all rabbinic law, biblically there's no such institution of ksuva, but the ksuva was a rabbinic invention of creating a prenuptial document to disincentivize a man from divorcing his wife. We have to appreciate that when the, insti when the institution of the ksuva was invented, it was done at a time when women were at extremely disadvantaged state in society, to the point where if a woman was divorced, there was very, her chances of living in abject poverty were very, very high. And therefore, the rabbis took a great concern to avoid divorce, and they created a financial disincentive for men to divorce their wives, so that wives should not be treated in a disposable fashion. And they therefore said that if you end up divorcing your wife, unless it's for cause, Right, where a wife has created a situation where it's impossible to live as husband and wife anymore, if the, if, if the husband opts out of the marriage, then he must pay his wife a financial sum that will keep her financially secure for the rest of her life, until, or until she remarries. Okay? That's the, what the, the function of the ksuva was. So that ketubot deals with that entire institution. Nidarim is the laws of vows, the reason why this is in, in the order of Nashim is because the Torah, in introducing us to the laws of taking vows, tells us that it is the husband's within the husband's purview to annul a vow that his wife takes, with certain limitations, of course. But if a woman takes a vow, and it, cre and it is a vow that pertains to their relationship, like for example, she says, I'm never going to bathe ever again. Well, the husband has a right to annul that vow because, for obvious reasons, okay? Yeah? So, uh, or if she says, I'm never going to eat a certain food again, which the husband and wife always used to eat together, and it affects their dietary needs or what, what they bring into their house, 
all of these. So anyway, so that's what Masechet Nedarim and why it's, it, even though it, it expands beyond the, the, the topic of husbands annulling wives' vows, but that's what it's doing in the Seder of Nashim. Nazir deals with the Nazirite. And even though this doesn't have anything directly related to Nashim in particular, because a Nazirite may be both male or female, but because in the Torah it is contained right next to the law of Sota, the rabbis, they're both in the book of Numbers in Parshat Naso, the Torah, the, the rabbis therefore placed, positioned Nazir next to Masechet Sota. Another reason is because they wanted to create an adjacency to tractate Nidarim and tractate Nazir, because the Nazir is a subset of, it's a type of Neder. So for example, if a woman takes a vow of Nazarism, this is also one of the vows that a husband has a right to annul, because it would affect their relationship. Okay, Masechet Gitin, he deals all with the laws of Get. And Masechet Kidushin, deals with the laws of the actual marriage ceremony. Um, and it's quite curious that these are at the end of, of the order of Nashim. And it's also curious that the law, the tractate of Gitin precedes the tractate of Kiddushin. The Gemara actually says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Hikdim Rufu'ah Lemaka, that God placed the cure before the malady. Think about that for a second. God, pla God places, always presents the cure before the malady. So therefore, tractate Gitin has to precede tractate Kiddushin. You need to know how to get out of it before you get into it. Okay. The laws of, of get, a divorce, Jewish divorce. Yes? The cash when you talk about a medal, let's say a woman is not married and she makes a medal, who can break it for her? I think not. Yeah, only her father, if she's a minor, can break it for her. Yeah, she's a not, if she's not married and she's not a minor, then the neder is binding. The vow is binding. No one can annul it for her. If the, again, if anything's unclear, feel free to ask. Feel free to ask if, you, I need to, if I'm not clarifying something that I should be. Yes? Did I skip Sota? No. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I skipped Sota. It's not, is it only adultery or is there other topics? Uh, it, Sota is primarily about how we treat a woman who is brought to the temple to receive the Sota service, which is the Sota protocols, where uh, it goes through the very uh, careful protocols of what, what the Torah means when it says that if a man accuses his wife of infidelity, he has grounds to bring her to the temple, and she is tested through the Sota waters. And so that's primarily what the tractate is about. And of course, there are always tangents. There's a lot of agadic literature in Sota as well. Um, remember, we mentioned that in Shas, the Talmud, the word Shas, by the way, you see the word Shas on the top of the sheet? It is an acronym for Shisha Sidarim, for the six orders of Mishnah and Talmud. Because, as we mentioned last week, the Mishnah writes the information in a very terse form, and the Talmud, which is written approximately 400 years after the, or 300, 300 to 400 years after the Mishnah, um, expands on the discussion of those very terse Mishnaic texts. So together, Shas refers to both the Mishnah and it refers to the Gemara, it refers to the Talmud in general. Um, okay. Uh, we move on to the fourth order, which is Nizikin. Nizikin means literally damages. And la more largely, it refers to financial law. The first three are, start all with the word bava. And the word bava means gate. Bava kama means the first gate. Bava mitzia means the middle gate. And bava batra means the last gate. Originally, these three masechtot were one large masechet of 30 chapters. It became unwieldy for students to master an entire tractate of 30 chapters that were very lengthy and very dense in material. So later, the sages divided this one tractate into three. 
and they called it the three gates. The three gates to what? To tort law, to financial law. So Bhavakama deals primarily with the damages, torts. Bhavamitsiya deals with, an, uh, with employment law. It deals with um, re- returning lost objects. Uh, it deals uh, with a number of other aspects of finance, of, 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 of workers' compensation, and so forth. Bhavabhatra deals primarily with real estate law. This is why Yeshiva Bacharin makes such good lawyers. <laughs> and I mean that in all seriousness, because they learn the basics of, of, of financial law when they study Gemara. There's a whole group of young men. There are certain law schools, some of them very prestigious, like Harvard Law, which if you do well on your LSAT, will not require you to have an undergraduate degree. A whole group of young yeshiva bachers from Lakewood are taking the LSAT, doing extraordinarily well, and getting admitted to Harvard Law without having spent a day in undergraduate school. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that they've mastered these tractates. Yes? Um, sorry, um, Bhatra means what? Mm-hmm. Last. So, Bhatra I always thought like Mitsia was from the Shorish, like to find something. Like, like, right, so, that's a misnomer. It's, yes. But it's not. Mitsia. Like, right, from the word emtsa. Yeah. That's right. Mitsia with an ayin, not Mitsia with an olive. Okay. Yeah. Yes, slavery is an institution in the biblical period as well as the Talmudic period. Slavery is only abolished relatively late, like in the 19th century. Okay. Um, Tractate Sanhedrin deals with the laws of the judiciary. Sharon, you should study Tractate Sanhedrin. Get ready. Okay. Makot deals, literally means uh, strikes. It deals with the laws of the administration of corporal punishment by the court, which is the administration of lashes for criminals. Shavuot deals with the laws of oaths. Now, there was another tractate that dealt with the laws of vows. Anyone remember what that was? Nidarim. Nidarim is in one order of Mishnah, Shavuot is in another order of Mishnah. One would think that they would be together. And that's one of the anomalies. We're not really sure why they are divided. There are many reasons that are offered for that. But a neder is more associated in its biblical context with a husband annulling his wife's vows. And that's why Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi felt it belonged in the order of Nashim. But Shavuot has financial rep- repercussions. If I, if I take an oath that I'm going to pay you a certain amount of money or that I owe you a certain amount of money, or if I take an oath denying owing money, there are financial repercussions to that. And therefore, it belongs in the financial section of Shas. And so therefore, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi divided them, put one tractate in Seder Nashim and one tractate in Seder Nizikim. Eduyot is testimony, so it's literally what it means. And it is not specifically geared towards financial law, but it is geared towards the judiciary of the Jewish people, where several of the leaders of the generations testify about laws that they remember from the Second Temple period and even before. Avodah Zarah are the laws of idolatry. Not really dealing with financial law, but more dealing with how the judiciary within the Jewish people has to deal with idolatry and uproot it from their midst. Avot, also known as Pirkei Avot, is the ethics of the fathers. Because when you deal with an order of Nizikin having to do with finance and the judiciary, you also deal with ethics. And Horayot are, literally means instructions, and it deals with when a court dispenses, makes a mistake and dispenses the wrong law and how they remedy that. Okay, that's, uh, that's all of Seder Nizikin.
Um, now, you'll note, and this is a very important point that I want to make at this juncture, not all tractates have both Mishnah and Gemara. Some tractates only have Mishnah, but the, those who created the Gemara, the Talmud, in the 4th or 5th century, did not see a reason to expand the discussion in a formal basis in a, in a Talmudic text. So, for example, Tractate Avot does not have a Gemara of, of Pirkei Avot. There's only a Mishnah of Pirkei Avot, but not a Gemara. And that means that the, those who composed the Talmud, Talmud Bavli or Talmud Yerushalmi, remember, Rabbi Yochanan wrote Talmud Yerushalmi, Ravina and Ravashi and Bavel in Babylon composed Talmud Bavli. They, at their discretion, chose which tractates needed to be expanded upon for further discussion and which didn't. Most of the tractates in the order of Zeraim do not have expanded tractates of Talmud. They only have the Mishnah, with rare exception. Also, some tractates only appear in the Jerusalem Talmud and not in the Babylonian Talmud as far as the expanded Gemara. Whereas some Gemaras are only in the Jerusalem Talmud, like for example tractate Shikalim has a Jerusalem Talmud expansion but not a Babylonian Talmud expansion. On the other hand, there are certain tractates that only appear in Talmud Bavli and do not appear in Talmud Yerushalmi. Kodoshim is the next order of the six orders of Mishnah, and that deals with holy things, literally, and that refers to the laws of sacrifices primarily, and corollary rules of sacrifices. So the first tractate is Zevachim, slaughtered animals that are placed on the altar. Menachot, flower offerings that are not slaughtered, obviously, but are comprised of flour that are offered in the temple. Chulin, means literally profane things. And that is the law of how you deal with meat products that are not going to be brought in the temple, but that are going to be on your dining room table. The laws of slaughter, the laws of koshering, the prohibition of mixing milk and meat, all appear in tractate chulim. Bichorot, the laws of dedicating your firstborn animal to the Kohen and bringing that as a korban, as a sacrifice. Arachin is another type of financial gift that you can make to the temple by declaring, and this is a biblical law at the end of Leviticus, where you would say, Erki or Erko Alai. I hereby pledge my financial value as a slave or someone else's financial value as a slave, and I dedicate that money to the temple. Timura deals with the law of exchange. That's literally the word Timura means exchange. There's a special law in the Torah that if a person has an animal that has already been designated as a sacrificial animal, and he then takes a second animal and he says, this animal is the tamura of the first animal, then both of them are sanctified and have to be brought as a sacrifice. And tractate tamura deals with that very technical law of what happens when you designate a second animal to be like the first animal. Kiritut deals with many of the laws having to do with the penalty of karet, which is a heavenly penalty that is not administered by a mortal court, but is a penalty that one incurs for violating any number of, of, um, of biblical commandments. And I'm not sure really why it's in Seder Kadoshim, other than the fact that there are so many types of heavenly penalties that are at stake if a person mistreats or misuses or abuses the temple. Mi'ila means violating holy temple property for personal use. And it's an entire tractate about that topic. Tamid deals with the daily sacrificial offering in the temple, one sheep in the morning, one sheep in the afternoon. That's what that tractate is about. Midot deals with the specifications and measurements of the actual temple structure, primarily dealing with the second temple, because the first temple had different dimensions, and the third temple also, which is yet to be built, 
has different dimensions as well. Kinim is one of the most complex tractates. It's only a Mishnah. There's no Talmud on tractate Kinim. And it literally means nests. And it was the rabbi's creative way of teaching mathematics because it deals with all different permutations of when a man or a woman wishes to bring a pair of birds to the temple. And the Torah many times says, let's say after a woman has just given birth, she brings two birds as a sacrifice, one as one type called the chatat sacrifice, and one for an ola. And what happens if the birds get mixed up? And as you can imagine, algebra plays a big role in tractate kinim, because you could have any number of permutations of combinations that expand on each other. And finally, the sixth order of the Mishnah is taharot, which deals, as the name implies, with purifications, the laws of ritual purity and impurity, tuma and tahara. And I'll run through this quickly. Kelim literally means utensils, deals with the laws of utensils contracting, ritual impurity by coming in contact with, let's say, a corpse, or a sheretz, which is a certain kind of dead, small animal that imparts tumah, ritual impurity. Ahalot, are the laws of contracting ritual impurity by being in the same uh, space under an overhang, under a tent, literally, as a corpse. Nigaim, deals with the laws of leprosy and the ritual impurity of leprosy. Para deals with the law of the ashes of the red heifer, which is the ingredient that is used to purify a person after having gone through ritual impurity of coming in contact with the dead. Taharot deals with other types of ritual purification that do not require the ashes of the red heifer. Mikvaot deals with the technical laws of the construction and maintenance of a mikvah, which is a pool, ritual pool for purification. Nida deals with the laws of a menstruant woman who also imparts ritual impurity. And uh, the reason for her ritual impurity is because anytime there's a voiding of life or potential life, what sets in in place of that void, of, right, in, in, in that void is this phenomenon called tumah. Machshirin deals with those things that prime something to receive tumah. And what I mean by that is that food items such as apples and oranges can become tameh, but only after they've been primed for receiving tumah, ritual impurity. And the priming involves them having come in contact with water after they've been harvested from their trees. Zavim deals with the law of a man or a woman who have an abnormal emission. A gun, they're called gonorrheal emissions. Any kind of abnormal emission that is not part of a regular menstrual cycle or seminal flow. Tevul Yom deals with the status of a person who's already gone to the mikvah but has not completed his purification process. Yadayim deals with the handles of utensils that um, can um, can also impart and transmit tumah, and oktsin deals with that's literally the stem of a piece of fruit, which also has it's a subcategory of that idea that sometimes something that is attached to a food item can also impart or impede the transmission of tumah, and that is the totality of uh, shas in a nutshell. Those are all of the tractates. Okay. Now, let, let us go on. I want you to get an idea of what a tzura tadaf is all about. Page 2 shows you what you should be looking for when you're looking at a page of Talmud. By the way, there's a great website called chinuch.org, C-H-I-N-U-C-H dot O-R-G, which was designed for teachers all over the world. And you can download all these different kinds of charts, flow charts, posters for your classroom. So in trying to find some nice charts, I found this on chinuch.org. Basically, teachers share and upload things that they've designed, and then we get to download it whenever we want. 
What you're looking at is two pages of the Talmud. And the reason why you're looking at two pages of the Talmud instead of one is because each page of Talmud is considered to be what we call a folio, which is a fancy word which means page. What, what is a page? This is a page. Now, when you think of a page, you just think of one side of paper, page one and page two. But that's not what pages are in Talmudic parlance. A page is a piece of paper that has two sides, side A and side B. So in Talmudic parlance, what your handout, which has three pieces of paper, is a three-page uh, tractate. There's side one, there's page 1A, page 1B, page 2A, 2B, and 3A and 3B. So therefore, every page of Talmud has either Amud Aleph or Amud Bet, side A or side B. Just think of the old 78 records that you collected when you were kids, if you're old enough. Some of you are not old enough. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. But there's always a side A to the LP or the 45, and a side B. So, um, so that's what, and therefore, in order for you to get a, a taste of that, the, the, um, this chart shows you, on the right side, it shows you Chaf Vav Amud Bet of Tractate Bava Metzia. And on the left side, shows you Chaf Vav Amud Aleph of Tractate Bava Metzia. Or in English, I'm sorry, Chaf Zayin Amud Aleph, I, I beg your pardon. On the right side is page 26B. And on the right and on the left side is page 27A. Once again, on, on page two of your handout, you have two pages of Talmud in front of you. On the right side is Chavav Amud Bet, which literally translates as 26B. And on the left side, you have page 27A, or Chav Zayin Amud Aleph. The page number is on the top corner. On the right side, it's on the top right corner. And on the left page, it's on the top left corner. Does everyone see that? If you're having trouble seeing that, please raise your hand so we can just point it out. Did you mean to say 26B and no. 27A? Yeah, 26B and 27A. Yeah, 26B and 27A. Now, why did the chart choose to show you 26B and 27A? For one very simple reason. In other words, why not 26A and 26B? Because the right side is always the B of the previous, and the left side is always A of the new page. The new page is always on the left side. And so the spine of the book, of the Gemara, is a line that's right between the two. The spine is right between the two. Now, it's important for you to know this in order to be able to get your bearings not only on the text of the Talmud itself, but also the commentaries that surround the text. If you notice the unique feature of the Talmudic text, it is surrounded by much smaller text in a different font, and not only in a different font, but in a different script. And it's called Rashi script, which is a variant to standard block the block alphabet of the Hebrew language. It's a variant script. And it was invented sometime in the Middle Ages. We're not, the history of it is not important, because it's, especially because it's a bit nebulous right now. But it is known as Rashi script, and it is the text, it is the type of script that you will find in the commentary surrounding the block letters that are contained in the middle. The middle text is what we call Gemara, or Talmud, and the surrounding script are primarily two commentaries, Rashi and Tosafot. Rashi and Tosafot. Now, in order to get your bearings, which commentary is Rashi and which commentary is Tosafot, 
That's also why you need to see two pages of Talmud. Rashi is always on the inside, and Tosafot is always on the outside of the page. So it's not that Rashi is on the right side or the left side. It depends on the orientation of the page. So on Chavav Amidbet, on 26b, Rashi is on the left side of the page and Tosafot is on the right side of the page. But on 27a, Rashi is on the right side and Tosafot is on the left side. Now that should be clearly marked for you in color. Where Tosafot is in blue and Rashi is marked in orange. Everyone see that? Yes. Page, do they, are they the same topics? Like, are they the same, are they talking about similar things that matter? Page numbers do not relate at all to the material that's contained within. So sometimes the topics will radically change from one page to the next depending upon the chapter and the mission of discussion. So you, you never know based on the page number. Why, yes, why Esther. Is, um, the page is always on the right and on the left? It's always like that? It's, that's just the convention. That's the convention that was chosen by the printer. Yeah. So to answer your question more comprehensively, you're really asking a very legitimate question from a logical standpoint. If the first page that you encounter will be on the right side, because in Hebrew we go from right to left, wouldn't you have expected the page on the right to be side A and the page on the left to be side B? What's the problem with that? Think of a page in a book. This is Tractate Shavuot, dealing with the laws of oaths. Okay, just happened to find it on the shelf. Cover page, Talmud Bavli, right? This is the first page of the actual text. Okay? It starts on the left side because the word daf is a piece of paper. Side A of the piece of paper is always on the left side. Side B of the piece of paper is the, you flipped over the record, you flipped over the page. Okay? So that's why the first page of every tractate will always start on the left side of the spine. Okay? Another unusual convention is that in, at least in Talmud Bavli, in the Babylonian Talmud, every tractate begins with page 2, <laughs> with page B, page, page Bet, not with page Aleph. Some have argued because it wants to be, wants to remind you, Talmud Bavli, <laughs> right? So it starts with the letter Bet, whereas the Jerusalem Talmud, which is from Eretz Yisrael, with an Aleph, starts with an Aleph, starts with a page one. Talmud Bavli always starts with, with, a, with a bet. Yes? So it always begins with a Mishnah followed by the Gemara, which is an elaboration of that Mishnah? Correct. The very opening of every tractate will always have a Mishnah. The very first text of a new chapter will always be a Mishnah. And then, over the course of, an, of a chapter, when, once the dis Talmudic discussion is exhausted on the first Mishnah, it will then print the second Mishnah of that tractate and then embark on a further discussion. So why is and, it called and, a Gemara? Gemara? Yeah. Simply this, means... This is Mishnah, so why isn't it called... No, what you're looking at now is a page of Gemara. You're looking... Oh, the, the, Gemara, Gemara. Okay. the Gemara is comprised of Mishnah and the Gemara. And, right. But we call it generically Gemara because the, the Gemara is an expansion upon the Mishnah. Right. So and we, I understand that. But when you read Mishnah, so this here that you gave us is actually a piece of Gemara. It's not a piece of, it's not in Mishnah. Correct. Okay. It contains the Mishnah. For example, if you look on 27a or Chaf Zion Ahmed Aleph, you will see in brown in block letters that are larger than the larger font size, the letters in, 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 enclosed in a brown diamond, mem, taf, nun, yud, with a little slash, right? 
that means matnitin, our Mishnah. It's the Aramaic for Mishnah, matnitin. And it means that we're embarking on a new Mishnah, and then at the end of that Mishnah, you'll see the next brown diamond, which has the two letters Gimel Mem in larger font size. That's short for Gimara, which means we're now starting a new expansion of that Mishnah that we just showed you, which is now, now a discussion. Okay? The top of the page, which is marked in green, it tells you three pieces of information on the top of the page. It tells you the name of the chapter, which in this case is Elu Mitziot, which is all about the laws of returning lost objects, if you find the lost object. And here, as you'll see, Mrs. Sonnenberg, it's Mitziot with an Aleph, not Mitziot with an Ayin. Okay? The middle two words tells you what number the chapter is. In this case, it's Perik Sheni, chapter 2 of Ch- Tractate Bava Mitziah. And the third piece of information is that it'll tell you the name of the tractate, the name of the Masechet, which is Bava Mitziah, the middle gate. Okay. Is the Mishnah laid out like this too? No. The Mish- a page of Mishnah does not have a standard format the way that Talmud Bavli has a format like this. It's not always surrounded with the same kind of Rashi script text as you see here. Many editions of the Mishnah are. Just like you have surrounding text, and on the inside, closest to the spine, is Rashi, and on the outside, closest to the edge of the page, is Tosafot, you will have certain editions of Mishnah, which are printed with only the Mishnah text, without the Gemara text, and they too have an inside commentary and an outside commentary. But the, the, co- the classic commentaries of the Mishnah are Rabbi Ovadia Bartanura on the inside, and Tosafot Yom Tov by Rabbi Yom Tov Lipman Heller on the outside, much later than Rashi and Tosafot. Now, just to give you an idea why Rashi and Tosafot are so important is because they really opened up the study of Talmud to a whole new generation of people who did not have access to the Talmudic information because over the course of generations it became inaccessible. And so in order to create more accessibility to a very cryptic text, in the 11th century Rashi wrote his commentary to almost every single tractate in Talmud Bavli. And with Rashi revolutionized the study of Talmud in the 11th century. So remember, the Talmud is composed 5th or 6th century. Rashi comes a half a millennium later and revolutionizes the study of Talmud and makes it more accessible. How did he make it better? Because he basically explains every single phrase that is cryptic in nature that needs to be elaborated upon. Studying the Talmud without Rashi as an accompaniment is anathema. No one, unless you're just reading a an English translation. You can't possibly understand the text of the Gemara without studying it with Rashi. It's virtually impossible. Um, Just to give you some biographical information, that's what page three is about, some biographical information of Rashi and Tosafot. Um, Yes. Nisikin, right? Mm-hmm. Masechet Baba Yes. Perik Elam Right? That's right. Elam is is Perik Is Perik Yes. And we've got Amud Bey and Amud Alu. What would the next page be? It would be Chaf Zayin Amud Bet and Chaf Chet Amud Alu. But we're still, it would still be in the same um, Perik and um, yeah, well, at some point you're going to end you're going to end the second chapter, and then you'll start the third chapter. And it could be on the same page. It could be on the same page. Yes. Got it. And how did they study before Rashi? Just Rabbi Kaplan just said you can't study without Rashi. Right. Well, you had to have much 
first of all, there was a certain zeitgeist of the language of the Gemara being well known orally, and there was a much heavier concentration on teacher-student transmission. But anyone who wants to pick up a page of Gemara and learn it by themselves can't possibly do so without having some background information, and Rashi provides you with all that information. So you either need a teacher to do that, or you need Rashi. Rashi is basically your, your book teacher, right? It's like, the, it's like the notes that explain what's going on. It's like trying to read Shakespeare today without some teacher or without notes. But multiply that by 10, right? And then you'll get the difficulty of understanding Talmud without Rashi. Yes? Two questions. Um, Mishnah language is Hebrew? Yes. Not Aramaic? By, by and large, yes. Okay. And it's, but it's a Mishnaic Hebrew that was endemic to the, to the time and place when the Mishnah was written, very different from Biblical Hebrew. And then when my kids say they're reading inside the Gemara or reading outside the Gemara, is that, what, what do they mean when they're saying they're reading inside or reading outside? Are they talking about the actual Gemara? Are they talking about the commentaries? Like, what are they referring to physically on the page? I'm not 100% sure, um, but it could be that inside the Gemara, they're referring to the actual text, and outside the Gemara may be referring to what they heard in a class, or heard in a shir, or what so was repeated to them. It could be referring to the commentaries. I'm not sure what they mean when they say outside the Gemara. It's not a standard terminology, at least not that I'm familiar with. Yes? So even though the Gemara was written, it was a long period between Gemara being put together and Rashi arriving. Yes. So you that is an excellent point. Mm -hmm. But it's very important to clarify what you just said. There is, a, there is an aspect of orality in every generation. The process of oral transmission is an ongoing process that continues to this very day. There will always be aspects of our tradition that can only be communicated orally. No matter how much literature we have, in order for it to be properly understood, there will have to always be some kind of teacher-student relationship. You will never, no one will ever be able to, no matter how many books we publish, will ever be able to get a comprehensive and accurate picture of the entire oral transmission. Now, one may argue that you can do that with Talmud. Talmud Bavli, for sure, we have reams and reams of books that have been composed over centuries that can, get, that can unlock almost every single word of the Talmud Bavli. But as we learned last week, the Talmud Bavli is only one component of our, of our Torah Shabbat al -Pen. What about the more esoteric portions of Torah Shabbat al -Pen, like Kabbalah? Those portions are still not completely unlocked, so that even after we've translated the Zohar into multiple languages, and we have multiple commentaries to the Zohar, there still needs to be some kind of educational process that a student undergoes from a master of Kabbalah in order to understand all of the terminology in its fullest sense. So there will always be an aspect of orality. At Rashi's time, that was sort of like a quantum leap, yes? From before Rashi to after Rashi. But even after Rashi, there were so many questions that were left unanswered. And that's why you have the Tosafos commentary which continues Rashi's project. And some scholars actually say, literally the word Tosafot means addenda. So what is it addendaing to? Some say that it's addenda to the Talmud, but most scholars say that it's addenda to Rashi and continuing Rashi's project, but in a, in a different format. Whereas Rashi was concerned about transmitting to you the simplest meaning of the text, the Tosafot commentary, which is written by multiple authors, not one author like Rashi, but multiple authors that are, are the, in the ensuing generation, the two centuries that follow Rashi, are interested in communicating topics so they do not go line by line commentary as Rashi does, but rather take a phrase and sometimes there'll be, let's say, five Tosafot paragraphs on a page five phrases from a page that may have dozens of phrases, and they will expand only on those phrases that need further elaboration. 
Some of the commentaries of Tosafot are halachically oriented, which means that we have a legal conflict. How do we resolve it? Some of them engage in a literary conflict. How do we resolve it? There's many, many different types of, of that commentary on the Talmud. So I've given you like a little bit of a taste from it from Wikipedia on the, the entry of Tosfos, but it's only a small part. Um, yes? I'm curious, is there any pushback during Rabbi Yudhu time to write this down? Yes, there was. There was pushback. It's not well documented, but what I mentioned last week was... Sorry, I missed No, that's okay. <laughs> if you look at Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi's statements in Pirkei Avot, you will see him responding to the pushback. But it has to be read with a discriminating eye. If you look at the very beginning of the second chapter of Pirkei Avot and you look at Rebbe's statements, you will note that he is defending his, himself from his detractors. Okay. Um, the next topic that we have, which I'll, I guess I will have to defer to next time, is hermeneutic methodology that is contained within the Talmud. It's an important discussion to try and understand how the rabbis used a very specific methodology to extract rabbinic law from the biblical text. And what I mean by rabbinic law, that's perhaps a misnomer. How they were able to extract practical law and how to do the mitzvot from the text. Okay, and that's really what I mean to say. So for example, how do you know that uh, there are 39 forms of forbidden labor on Shabbat? The Torah, doesn't, the Torah just says do not do work on Shabbat. How do you know that that translates into 39 categories of prohibitions? That's derived from Talmudic hermeneutics. The rabbis looked at certain texts and they were able to extract certain details of the law from the way that the text presents itself in the, in the Bible. There, are, there, are, there is a Baraita, which is a Mishnaic text, a text that is from the Mishnaic period, authored by Rabbi Yishmael, not by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, which gives us 13 hermeneutic principles. Next week we'll run through that very quickly to give you an idea that once we are able to understand at least the methodology, then we'll be able to, in weeks four and five, actually go into a piece of Gemara and start studying it properly. Yes? What is the word hermeneutic? I was just going to ask you that. What's the Hebrew word for that? Drashot. Drashot. To, to, to make a drasha, to extract. It's, 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 we can use hermeneutics and exegetics interchangeably, but it really hermeneutics really refers to deriving text, deriving commentary from the biblical text. It's not named after a guy named Herman, though. Okay. Have a good night, everyone. We'll continue next week.